so far in this class, we have been making a simplifying assumption. And that simplifying assumption is that some object like this, we have been treating it exactly as a point mass. So what that means is even though this is an extended body, we've been pretending that this object, or this object here, all of its mass is concentrated at a single point. And we know that because what we've been saying is it doesn't matter where these forces are acting on the object. All that matters is that we have forces acting on the object. Of course, in reality, this is not true. And this is not true because almost everything we're going to deal with is such as this, or like this, an extended body. Now, we also know that this is also not true because if I have an extended body, depending on how I push on this object and where I push on this object is going to cause the object to do different things. For example, if I take this object and I push it here, I can cause it to accelerate or at least move in a straight line. However, if I push the object away from this center point, more towards the top, it's going to simply rotate and flip over. This point, and where I can get this thing to actually move in a straight line, is what we call the center of mass. So even though this object here is an extended body, it has a very special point, where that special point is what we call the center of mass. So what else can we say about this point? We can also say that this point is the point where if I took this eraser and I throw it across the room, or I take this hammer and I also throw that across the room, even though this object is flipping around and doing interesting things, its overall path and its overall trajectory follows a particular point of the center of mass. So as this hammer is flying through the air, it flies in such a way that it still goes under parabolic motion, but that parabolic motion is about this particular point, which is what we call the center of mass. So. The center of mass, then, is the most important part of this object because depending on where I push on this object relative to the center of mass will cause it to do different things. So again, if I push directly at the center of mass, I can cause it to move in a straight line. Whereas if I push at the bottom here, I cause it to flip over. Or if I push it away again from the center of mass, that's also going to cause it to rotate and flip over. So how do we determine, then, the location of the center of mass? Well, let's say here's my object, and I want to know where's the center of mass of this object. Now, one thing to point out is that center of mass, just like things like position, are going to be coordinate system dependent. So depending on where I put my coordinate system, that will then determine the actual coordinates of the center of mass. However, the location on the object where that center of mass is, is independent of the coordinate system, just the coordinates are actually dependent on that coordinate system. So, <clears throat> how do we do this? So let's say we're going to take this object and chop it up into a whole bunch of small pieces. Let's call this delta m1, call this piece here delta m2, got another piece over here, let's call that delta m3, another piece down here, let's call that delta m4, and etc. Each one of these are located at a particular point according to this coordinate system. So from here I'm going to have a radial vector, which is the position vector, so this is going to be r1. Another vector here, this is going to be then R2. Another vector to here, this is going to be R3. And another vector to here, this is called R4, and etc. Now the claim is that we're going to sum together all of these, but this is going to act as if this is entirely located at one particular point, which we're going to call the center of mass. So this is my center of mass location. So this thing is going to have its own radial vector, r center of mass. So we then say is that what? The total mass of this object, so delta m1 plus delta m2 plus delta m3 plus delta m4 plus blah blah blah, all times the center of mass location, then is equal to the weighted average of all of these different points basically means that this is going to be the same thing as delta m1 times r1 plus delta m2 times r2 plus delta m3 times r3 plus blah blah blah. So this tells me then that the location of the center of mass is then equal to delta m1 times r1 vector plus delta m2 times r2 vector plus delta m3 times r3 vector plus delta all divided by the sum of all of those masses. Delta M1 plus delta M2 plus delta M3 plus delta M4 plus blah blah blah. Or in summation notation, this says then that the sum 
over all the individual masses delta m i times their position, r i vector, divided by the total mass, where the total mass is defined as simply the sum over all those individual masses. So what does it say? It says that basically the position of these individual masses is dependent on its actual mass, which means that the position is weighted by the mass of the object. For example, if I had these three objects, the position then of the center of mass for each one of these different objects would then be, in this case, close to the center, because this one and this one would be the most important since they have the most amount of mass. This one has the least amount of mass, so this one would be the least amount of importance. But if I took this and switched it to the other side, now the center of mass location is going to be roughly about here, because again, this one has the least amount of mass. These two are much more massive, which means that they have more importance according to the sum. So this sum says that the position is weighted by the mass, so the more massive the object is, the more importance it has to here. Now, again, this is only true for then discrete objects. So this is the center of mass location for discrete objects. For example, again, the eraser, the water bottle, and the hammer are all what I would consider then to be discrete masses. But what if I had some sort of continuous object? such as this ruler. So how would we calculate in that case? Well, in this case, what we would do is we would simply take the, each one of these masses now becomes infinitesimal. So we would take the limit <coughs> that each one of these masses would go to zero. So in this case, our R center of mass location would then be equal to the limit as delta M goes to zero, and then the sum over delta I r vector i divided by the total mass. But if I take the limit as mi goes to zero, this thing becomes a differential, which means that this becomes an integral. So this then becomes simply the integral over r vector dm all divided by then the net mass. Now, what is d then? So this is for continuous objects. So what is dm? Well, dm is kind of an interesting quantity because how do we actually take something and then integrate over its differential mass? Well, we don't really do that. So in practice, what we end up doing is we end up taking this dm and then turning it into an integral over the geometry, <clears throat> which means that we're going to rewrite dm in one of three ways. We're either going to write it then as lambda dl, eta dA, or rho dB where lambda is equal to the total mass divided by the total length, eta is equal to the total mass divided by the total area, and rho then is equal to the total mass divided by the total volume. <clears throat> so we use this top one then when a system has then line symmetry. So for example, if I was looking at this ruler, I would then use line symmetry on this because all the mass is contained straight to this straight line. So in that case, how to rewrite dm then as the linear mass density times the differential length. If it has an area symmetry, for example, like this paper, so in here, this has an area symmetry to it. So here I would cut this into a small differential area. So in that case, we would integrate then over the area. Or if something has basically no symmetry to it at all, say something like this hammer, then we would have to break it up and then integrate over the entire volume. But again, in practice, we have to do an integral over the geometry of the object as opposed to actually doing an integral over the differential mass. That doesn't really make any sense. So this is the center of mass. Now once I know the center of mass of the object, we can then generalize everything that we've looked at so far in this class to talk about the object, how this thing flies through the air, in terms of its center of mass. So in this case, the velocity of the center of mass is then equal to the change in position or the displacement of that center of mass with respect to time. The acceleration of the center of mass then is equal to the change in center of mass velocity with respect to time. The net force acting on the system, so the sum of the forces, then is equal to the 
total mass of the object times the center of mass acceleration. And then finally, the momentum, or the net momentum of the system, then would be equal to the total mass times the velocity of the center of mass. So structurally wise, all of these laws stay exactly the same way, except now there are terms of the actual center of mass quantities as opposed to the point mass quantities.